a dramatic before and after, plus a little science in the garden. And we'll take a look at why we're building better, not bigger. It all starts right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. Now, this is a show about design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, as you can see, we're in high construction mode. We're really underway with the home here at The Garden Home. But just take a look at the garden. We're pulling together all of the raised beds, filling them with soil, and some of them are actually planted. You know, whenever I design a garden, I fall back on 12 principles of design to help pull the garden together. It's just a common sense guide or checklist. Items such as structure or framework, like we're seeing out here at the garden home. Framing views. Color, now that's one that really gets me excited. Now we'll touch on a few more of these principles a little later in the show when we visit a project I'm working on in the heart of a neighborhood. But first, let's take a look at what's going on here with the construction. For some time now, I've been fascinated with this idea of building greener, both for home and garden. And apparently I'm not alone. If you look at what's available to home builders these days, well, you find that manufacturers really are thinking greener when it comes to the products they offer. And I'm trying to incorporate as many as I can into this project. Now, when you think about the layout of this foundation, well, it looks colossal, but actually this is a pretty small house. It's really only three bedrooms and three baths. Now, it may look larger because I'm adding some porches. You see, on paper, it's going to look something like this. This is an elevation view of the front. The style is Greek Revival. Now, a signature element of this style is big, bold proportions. And you can see that it has a simple, fluted, Greek columned porch. Now, I feel like this style fits the landscape because it's a style that was popular when this property first became a farm. I've worked with architect Ward Lyle on several projects, including this wonderful Italian style home that sits beautifully into the landscape. When Ward and I worked out the drawings for the gardener's cottage, he kept coming back to this idea of building better, not bigger. Here at the Garden Home Retreat, we're trying to embrace the concept of building better rather than bigger. So what we've done is really examine the way in which spaces are used to cut out any unnecessary space. So we've reduced the size of the house compared to the typical house, but it allows us to upgrade the quality of a lot of the furnishings and features in the house. And it also allows us to embrace some green building technologies that'll make the house more energy efficient and more comfortable to live in. For example, we're using these styrofoam ICF forms for the basement walls. And they accomplish three things. They're more energy efficient, they're a green building component. They incorporate recycled products, and they're also stormproof. This basement foundation wall system is just the tip of the iceberg. We've taken a top to bottom look and reevaluated how you go about building a house and tried to find the most practical green concepts that we could incorporate easily and affordably into this house, yet still get the maximum benefit from them. So here at the Garden Home Retreat, building better rather than bigger means not just taking a look at the size of the space and reducing it to just what's necessary. It also means that we get to upgrade the quality of some of the features of the house and embrace the newest green building technologies to create a space that's more energy efficient, more comfortable, and has less impact on the planet. As Ward and the design team work out the details of the house, my guys are laying out the garden and making great strides. Now, you know, I mentioned the 12 principles of design when I create a garden. Let me show you how I'm incorporating them in the garden. Now, one of the first principles to think about is structure. When we consider our homes, we certainly think about structure. There are the walls, the floor, the ceiling, and so forth. When you think about a garden, you really should think about it the same way. Here in my garden, I've used things like stone walls, boxwood, holly hedges, even some iron hoops and espaliered trees. All of these elements lend structure and form and shape to the garden. Now, another principle to think about, which makes a lot of sense, is focal point. 
It's some object in the garden that captures your eye. And by doing this, you can also use it as a way to organize the space around it. Here, the obvious focal point is the beautiful vista of the valley beyond. And even though we're in the middle of construction, you can begin to get the idea of what's going on here. You see, for instance, at the end of this arched walkway, there's a magnificent fig tree. And at the center of the terrace gardens, there'll be a pool, which is under construction, as you can see. And of course, mystery is a fun element or principle of design to play around with. In one garden I designed, I used ancient stones that stood upright, kind of a Stonehenge-inspired bit of garden ornament. But seriously, the path these boulders were placed on was slightly curved, so as you walked along, you really couldn't see the end. I'm doing the same thing in my vegetable garden by placing the raised beds on the same slight curve as the walkway. Without you being completely aware, it draws you through the space. And then what about entry? It's such an important principle of design when it comes to creating a garden. Look at your house. Everyone knows where the front door is. You direct someone to the entry to your home. Well, you should do the same in the garden. Entryways should be accented and they should direct people from one place to another. Of course, there are many other elements of design that we could talk about, but the one I wanna focus on now is color. It's one of my favorites. From spring daffodils to summer wildflowers, we're slowly but surely painting with plants out here in the garden home. In just a few months, some of the vivid brush strokes will become apparent in the vegetable garden. The beds will literally be spilling over with petunias and coleus and phlox and other annuals. So how can you get color in your garden home? Well, you want to start with a backdrop of evergreen plants, such as boxwoods, yews, hollies, cryptomeria, or cypress. You get the idea. And if you don't know what to plant, drive around town and see what's working for your neighbors. Take photos and bring them into your garden center. And while you're at it, talk to the nurseryman about getting the soil right. This is so important. And then get out there and plant a nice mix of both annuals and perennials. This is what I do. Several years ago, I had the great pleasure of touring the private garden of the Duchess of Devonshire. There we talked about her newly planted cool color borders that were full of a mixture of her favorite plants. Well, Your Grace, I see you even have hollyhocks growing here in the borders. Oh, hollyhocks, my very favorite, love them. But the ones I like best of all, the ones that are nearly black, don't you? Oh, I love those, the big single blossoms. Yeah. And they are almost black. They're nearly, they're as near black as you can get in a flower, I guess. Now, that's a beautiful white one. Yeah. Well, my mother used to say she hated white flowers. She said <laughs> <laughs> they were like bits of paper blowing about. I see. Well, it was, uh, I guess it wasn't fashionable then to have white flowers in the garden. Well, she was a uh, law unto herself. She didn't, didn't go for fashion. I she see, just, right. She just would have didn't or not like have. them. But now, this is what you were talking about, these pale blue grays. Yes, these uh, wonderful color. This is sea holly and uh, the nice gray foliage and then that sort of metallic blue is fantastic. Even the stalk is metallic, isn't it? It is, look at that. Beautiful. Sensational. They're really beautiful. And you've mixed a lot of annuals in with the perennials. Well, that's very nice. <laughs> that's, that's what you could call a stopgap. <laughs> this is new, you see, so the perennials haven't got very big. Sure. And the annuals are... Um, just, well, there's a top gap. There's well, it's a, a trick I used in my garden as well. Until the perennials matured and the roses, I filled in with lots of annuals. And then do the chickens get in? They, the bantams, they the do. Bantams. They run through the, the, uh, the, the flowers and do don't seem to bother them. They don't scratch it. Not really. I think the larger hens would, but bantams don't. So I allow them to run in the garden. I'd love to see your bantams. <laughs> when you make a border, do you put mostly perennials? and just wait for them to get good and fat and well-liking? Or do you put roses in with them? Do you put annuals again? Or well, what do you do? What I do is I start with, uh, with a framework in the back, some sort of dark backdrop for it to all hang on. And then I'll fill in with a few roses and uh, add the perennials and then put in annuals to fill in. And then I'll study it for a year because I know I always want to change things and then I'll reduce the annuals the next year and add a few more perennials after I've had a chance to study it. And they've had a chance to grow. And they, right, and see who likes who, and if, yes. if they're, 
if they're working out together, if they like uh, who they're planted next to. And do you sometimes have a client who says, I want it like that straight away, I don't want to wear <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Those are always the most difficult because you can't, you can't do that with a garden. You, can't. you have yeah. to have patience. Well, thank you so much for having me here at Chatsworth. Well, it's been a pleasure. It's been marvelous. And um, I, I can't believe the change I've seen in the past 15 I'm years. I'm very glad if you yeah. think it's all right. Good. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was actually there to interview the Duchess, but from time to time it felt like she was interviewing me. She's very inquisitive and creative. You know, Chatsworth is a wonderful place to get inspired by color. So why don't we recap some of those points about color. Plant an evergreen backdrop. Get your soil right and then add in perennials and annuals. Now, as far as the colors you might plan to use in a garden, well, to me, it's up to your personal preference and the sort of mood you want to create. For instance, if you're into cool blues, well, there's a range of flowers you would use. Or if you're into hot, fiery reds, well, there's a palette there to work from as well. In these beds, since it's the first year, I just thought I'd have some fun and put in lots of different kinds of plugs and seed and just see what happens. It's gonna be a kaleidoscope of color. Of course, the color of your house plays an important role in the colors you choose. After all, it's the largest object in your landscape. You can't ignore it. Now, speaking of the color of the house, I've mentioned to you a project that's much smaller in scale, but we're applying those principles of design. Here, we're wrestling with the color of the house and the garden walls. Come on, let me show you what I mean. Well, here we are at the good ones, and you can see that the brick is painted. And I love the style, it's English cottage. And you can see that on each side of the door, they've placed a pair of evergreens with these handsome gas lanterns. Now, I'm gonna follow this path around to the back where the makeover's about to begin. You know, whether we live in an urban or suburban situation, we always have to deal with ambient sound. It can be blowers and mowers, it can be construction, even car noise can get in the way of creating our own little paradise. But you see, what's going on here is the good ones are really off to a good start. Look at this brick wall, it's fantastic. It already gives them a sense of privacy and does block out some of the noise. The other thing they have going for them is they've got this beautiful brick patio. So now it's up to us to accent these walls and come up with a comfortable living space on the patio, all with a great deal of style. Now during the design process, the first thing I want to consider is this very strong axis that works through the center of the house all the way to this wall. You see, here's an opportunity to create a focal point on this wall of this garden room. So we can literally look through the doors and windows out into this space. The other thing we've got to keep in mind is that we've got a colossal magnolia tree right out in the middle of the garden. So that's going to dictate the plants that we choose to go in this particular space. Of course, the great thing about this tree is it offers some shade in the hot afternoon from the western sun. Now let's take a look at this wall. I think it's a real opportunity to paint a little garden vignette. I'm thinking it'd be nice to have some vertical elements on each side to frame the view and to integrate in some way a water feature so that the sound of the water would somehow mask the neighborhood sounds. The other thing that I think would be nice here is to maybe in the corner put in a flowering tree. And the patio, well, as I mentioned before, it's ripe for creating a beautiful setting, something as comfortable as the inside of the house. So I'd like to pick out some really handsome patio furniture and really make this a room. You know, whenever I design a garden, I try to be as green as possible. And that's looking for ways to help the client save time and money. It's a part of my being green program. Now let's get back to the plants. I think one that'll really set this space off is a hydrangea with a pink flower. You see, it'll echo the color of the impatience they've already planted around the house. Now, did you know that hydrangeas are ideal problem solvers for shade gardens? You see, problem solvers in turn save us time and energy because they're taking what could be a great deal of work and turning it into something beautiful. When it comes to hydrangeas, there's a wide range of blooms and styles you can choose from. You're probably familiar with the old fashioned variety. You know, the ones with the large pom-pom-like blossoms that can bloom pink or blue depending on the soil chemistry. This creamy white variety that I have growing in my center garden is called Annabelle and we've caught it at one of my favorite stages of development because within the same plant, there are nice subtle variations in bloom size and color. Annabelle hydrangeas are wonderful in contrast with plants with variegated foliage, like this dogwood. 
and this variegated miscanthus grass. These large blossoms will persist through the summer, right up until the fall, at which time I'll bring them in for drying. Here's another variety of hydrangea that I planted just last year called lace cap. The name obviously comes from the lacy appearance of the bloom. Now, what I find interesting about this plant is that in a single blossom, you actually have two kinds of flowering going on. These tiny little flowerets in the center are fertile. They have both male and female parts, while on the edge, these large showy ones are sterile. They serve to lure pollinators. No matter what variety of hydrangea you choose, you'll find that they like plenty of humus or organic matter in the soil and consistent moisture. If you've got a shady area, you might give one of these guys a try. And if you do go for some of those old-fashioned mop head hydrangeas, here's something to keep in mind. The color of the bloom is dictated by the soil pH. For instance, if you want beautiful pink flowers, you want to make sure that your soil is sweet or alkaline. And for blue flowers, you want to make sure the soil is acidic. Now let's think about the color of this garden for just a moment. We have a greenish taupe painted brick, and we have lots of red brick in this back area. So I think a pink hydrangea would be beautiful or even a white one. But if you think about pink, it works really well with the red brick color. It echoes beautifully in the pink impatience, or even the begonias planted at the base of that colossal urn at the front of the house. Now, beautiful containers are part of any gorgeous outdoor setting, and we'll certainly have plenty of them here on the Goodwins patio. I want to give you a couple of tips on how to arrange and plant containers. What I'm doing here is I'm starting with three different size pots and I'm going to group them together, large, medium, and small. I'm using terracotta because I think it blends beautifully with the brick. And with this particular design, you can see that we have a copper band around it, which is echoed in the glazed pot here in front of me. Now the other thing I'm doing is I'm using all foliage plants. You can get really beautiful color and visual interest from just foliage. You don't have to have blooms. So I'm using an autumn fern here, a gorgeous plectranthus here, and in this large pot, I'm going to plant a coleus. Now this variety is called Kingswood Torch. Now I know these plants look small. You're thinking, how is that gonna look great? But you just wait. In just a few weeks, these plants will fill this entire container. Now back to what I said earlier. What I'm doing is I'm filling each one of these containers with one variety of a foliage plant. Now let's get down to some planting techniques. Starting with a good potting soil, all right? And then I'm going to add a water-retentive polymer to just to make sure that the moisture stays consistent in the soil. On top of that, I'm using a slow-release fertilizer, which will feed these plants for up to four to five months. And then I just water them in. You just wait, it'll be colossal. So what do you think? These foliage plants will be a nice addition to the makeover and will go a long way in finishing the look of a seamless outdoor living space. So now, we've taken a flat back lawn and turned it into a full-bodied outdoor living space. The combination of old-fashioned hydrangeas, boxwoods, hostas, and the dogwood tree brought a touch of nature to an otherwise stark red brick wall. A stepping stone path, plus potted autumn fern, plectranthus, and this big lush red coleus, just look at how it's grown, connects the garden with the patio. Now each area of the lawn connects with another, giving you the feeling of a whole complete garden room. To finish, we've added two lollipop wax leaf ligustrums and a stone fountain to help draw the eye from inside the house outside to your new living space. I think the completed garden looks fantastic, don't you? Okay, now let's step into the design studio for a different kind of makeover, a virtual makeover. Welcome to my design studio. Today we've got a good looking house in Virginia. You can see it's a farmhouse style and we basically have a blank slate here in the front. I think it has a lot of potential. Some of the things that I really like about this house include its color. That soft butter yellow, I think, lends itself to a beautiful color palette. You could go all white. Just think about everything planted here blooming white. It could really be fantastic. Now, another element I like about this house is the fact that the porch is large. It's generous. You can see it runs three quarters across the house. And then you have these really wide, generous steps coming down here, really inviting. Now, a few things I would change would include 
trying to screen off the driveway here just a bit, maybe with a hedge. Don't really like seeing the garage door. And the other thing to keep in mind is this lattice. It's white and my eye is drawn to it. And maybe what we do is we pick up the color here and we bring this color down here and paint the lattice where it's dark and it goes away and doesn't pop out. All right, now let me give you some tips on some planting. Let's get this erased. You know, I think that this house faces the southwest so we get lots of sun in the afternoon. What I would like to see happen here is perhaps a hedge, a low boxwood hedge along this side of the house here. Um, beyond you can see the neighbors and I think uh, some tall columnar evergreens, maybe just three along there, just to help break that up would help. And then we need some sort of a tree here, some small flowering tree would be beautiful, maybe a snowball viburnum, perhaps a cherry tree, and I would do the same thing here on this end. Maybe even one of the star magnolias would be pretty. Then I think that I would like to bring a hedge along here. And this could be white spirea. You know, it's the old fashioned bridal's wreath spirea. So I'd bring a hedge of it all the way along here and it could possibly even turn the corner just a bit here right against the sidewalk. Now, I'd also make this bed a little more generous and bring it around and I would bring a bed all the way across and here I would divide the garden with a fence, probably just a white picket fence that would really match the style of this house with a gate here, there's the fence along here, you can see, maybe there's a stepping stone and then beyond I would definitely plant maybe a flowering cherry tree there to sort of stop the eye so you're not looking back to those houses beyond. This looks like a very new neighborhood. Now I'd also take that picket fence idea and I would put a post here just on this side. You see you have a walk that runs all the way across to the steps. I'd put another post there and do just a bit of picket like that and then I would bring in a bit more of that hedge to connect it so you create a garden room. Now they've planted a tree here in the front. You can see and I think it's a redbud tree. Probably what I would do is use this small ornamental tree. It could perhaps be moved over here to the corner on either side because it won't get terribly large. And since this house faces the southeast, you're going to get an awful lot of sun. And I'm thinking here is where I would want an enormous shade tree. Maybe it's a sugar maple, maybe it's a red maple, something that would give me gorgeous fall color. And just think about it, during the summer, with the sun coming through, you're going to enjoy sitting on that porch much more with the shade of the tree there in place. Just a few suggestions and I hope they help. <music>